Hello everybody, thank you for joining. This is your host Nino inviting you to another book review. But before we begin, do you know what appears in Embeddable Common Lisp in the top row of the authorship? Look carefully. Taichi Yuasa and Masami Hagia. The authors of Kyoto Common Lisp, which later became Austin Kyoto Common Lisp, and spawned into multiple other Lisp systems such as ECL but also GCL like GNU Common Lisp and a couple of others. And this is Introduction to Common Lisp by these authors themselves. <laughs> and it's an absolutely amazing book which I absolutely love. It is one of my most favorite Lisp books. And despite its age, being sometime from the 80s, and while this looks so new, this is simply because it's a scanned reprint. And you can see it sometimes where there are scanning errors. But originally it was published in, yes, 1986 uh, in Japanese and 1987 in English. So, <laughs> This is a really good one. It's not very big. Yeah, you can see that it's moderately large, but absolutely readable. It is an excellent introduction, which has one particular strength, which also comprises its particular weakness, namely that it is perhaps too systematic. That is, once the authors start treating a topic, they will, as exhaustively as they find it reasonable, treat it to the end. In, in other words, beginner concepts are being followed by advanced concepts if it matches the topic, and it does not go from beginner level towards advanced level while, you know, ripping apart concepts which otherwise would belong together. And this, this precision, this systematism in it is also a very valuable property of the book in case you want to use it as a sort of reference. Because, you know, once you end up in a topic, you will very quickly read up on a couple of concepts, simple as well as advanced, which you might then use. So that is why, even after you do know Lisp, this book remains very valuable. Now, first, they are um, telling a little bit about the evaluation sequence, namely that Lisp is evaluating expressions left to right, and the trade giving you an example of what would be happening in case you would be evaluating it the other direction. So you see it starts simple, but already discusses things uh, which, which would be having a practical um, a practical effect and which maybe a novice would not immediately all that much pay attention to but they not only mention them they give examples then as they are trying to let you you know get a bit around in this and just start to feel better there is an absolutely idiot safe introduction of how to type uh, 12 plus 5 at the list prom prompt you know, that you're opening the left parenthesis, a plus, a white space, a one, a two, a white space, a five, and a right parenthesis. I mean, I love that. They really want to make sure that if you try to get into Lisp, it will be a successful endeavor. Then, uh, they are showing you already... You know, some, some things which you could be doing with function definitions and that you could be, of course, using global variable definitions, but that there is something better than that, uh, namely let and how you can use it win within functions and also in order to, you know, gain intermediate values and, and perhaps thereby avoid repeated function applications. Then uh, comes something which I haven't ever seen, and certainly not so early in, in, in any book, and that is macro expanding on the uh, logical connections on AND and OR. So that you're seeing 
what uh, <laughs> what has what effect. I mean that that's pretty cool. So you're brushing you're brushing shoulders with conditionals just as with macros rather early on. And yeah, already in the next page you already learn a little bit about if and when and only afterwards do they introduce cond, which might be a good thing given that in many other programming languages there is uh, an equivalent to if directly. And like, you know, like, like such a bifurcation where cond allows you to have as many tests as you like. So maybe that's a good thing for, for someone just starting. A little, a little weird is that uh, you, you do start to get into multiple valued functions already on page 39. And you might be thinking, why? Well, because it is systematically, of course, not incorrect to say that when you are treating uh, functions, then you should also be already treating multiple valued functions. And, <laughs> and that is what I meant in the beginning, that sometimes certain advanced concepts, such as multiple valued functions certainly are, um, come simply together with, with easier and, and, and more common concepts just because that fits the system of the author's presentation of Lisp in general. And they do not only tell you about multiple value bind, as many other uh, books are doing, but they tell you of the entire multiple value show, uh, including set list prog one and call. So <laughs> they, they then venture into showing it to you like um, each one. And you know, that's perhaps the first book I have seen, like apart from such um, works which describe the entire standard, which are really handling um, such multiple value functions. Or like many others are just telling you a little bit of about multiple value bind, some really just even without any example, and, and, and to omit everything else, whereas this one really does try to get into it. Now, at some point also comes looping, and here it is perchance somewhat amusing the looping star constructs are being shown to start with tag body and go. I am a fan of that. I like tag body go, but it certainly is the Lisp equivalent of go to, and <laughs> therefore there are enough people who are not exactly fans of it. However, it is also one of the original looping constructs, like one of the oldest things which really go back to the very first versions of Lisp from the 1960s. But it's not a bad way to begin. And then we get to, to looping and also to do uh, to, to the do macros, which are allowing you other more complex looping constructs. And as it may be considered systematic, they are again presenting you with catch and throw. And what is really nice is that, um, that that's actually a rather nice explanation of catch and throw. Uh, here actually you're having like the introduction to it. And the idea is that they, are, that they are also mentioning why commonly symbols are chosen. It is so because the comparison by default is happening with ek, and therefore in, in some cases um, there wouldn't be a catch, although there should be perchance, you know. So anyway, catch and throw get a little bit of an in-depth treatment, quite early on compared to other things which are still left to do but again because that is what the authors deem apparently as the systematic thing to do now equally systematic but quite late is this is the treatment of symbol names and you know how you can be um, like how the Lisp reader would understand symbol names, how you can define particular symbol names, where you, for instance, insist on on certain cases and so on. So, so that's 
Perhaps something one would not expect on page 70, 71, after having learned, as you just saw, about multiple value, whatever, and 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 the conditional system, and and so on and so forth, and macro expansion. You would somehow think, wait a minute, that should have been um, elsewhere, but for systematic reasons, because now they are talking about symbols and packages, they are mentioning it here <laughs> and then equally systematic and detailed they are going into explaining you how intern works which i find really sweet and lovely because most books just mention how oh, there is intern and you can turn a string into a symbol but they are also talking about how you can be putting it into certain packages and so on and so forth and of course giving you a lot of examples so that's again a systematic in-depth treatment and for a novice that gives a clear overview the thing I am never quite fond of and I mention every time if you want to do the reverse that is turn a symbol into a string you will you best will be using coerce but um, that's not exactly a very symmetric way of handling symbol to string and string to symbol handling, right? Then they get a little bit into equality and they are, they are doing their best in order to describe you the hierarchy and they are giving also a lot of um, examples of, of how, how Eck and equal are working and that for instance you cannot ima expect wonders so uh, equal one and and the symbol one will do nothing in particular but they also do show you how x here does manage to catch same symbols so x and y are both defined as one word and they are x among each other and just these quoted symbols are also x among each other However, uh, you know, they show you further on that certainly this is not the case for, for everything else and that therefore Eck lists AB and AB result in nil. So there is quite an in-depth treatment of Lisp equality operations in here, which I am actually very fond of. <laughs> now, the next thing that happens uh, and here they show you what, what the issue is, that uh, uh, that they are not pointing together towards the same thing, but they are pointing towards something which happens to be the same, but is in different places, and that in such a situation you do not have an egg. All right, then happens something funny. They are having perhaps the most in-depth and most open discussion I have ever seen on local functions, namely flat and labels and they are having an excellent example on on how they work differently in that uh, labels allows a reference to an inner function which is defined within its scope whereas flat will resort to a global function if it is defined and that it is for that reason that you can use labels in order to express local recursion and not a flat and here you're having a function foo which is increasing x by one and here you're having a function a flat which is also having a function foo which is decreasing x by one okay so the question is which one will be used and then they're showing you a function bar which is just simply calling foo and, and the question will be which foo will it be will be the one called and when you are trying bar of 10 then you see the result is 11 because this one is called and 10 is increased to be 11 whereas labels keeps it local the definition here is the same but when you're calling bar of 10 it becomes 9 because it decreases x rather than increasing it as this is a local reference and <laughs> for the first time I must say I see such a nice um, outline and, and description and then we're getting towards um, 
ja, Fun Calling and Multiple Value Calls and, <laughs> and also, you know, um, juxtaposing them next to each other so that you have an idea how you can use a fun call thing but on functions which are having multiple values in their return. And then we're getting into lexical closures. So you see an in-depth treatment which one rarely sees otherwise. I haven't ever seen actually multiple value call mentioned anywhere close to fun call though systematically it is undisputably a very good idea to do so and then come yeah nice mapping examples oh yes the mapping functions so very sensibly they start with map car and uh, and, and like easy well understandable examples how you can be consing things and and how the whole thing will end after the uh, length has been exhausted, which is properly present, and how one can actually map car also a locally defined function, and so on and so forth. So the mapping examples are nice. You also are happening to get examples of map list and map C. So uh, also including with in in ink and things like that. So all in all. Um, very good discussion of the mapping functions and multiple examples and not as in some other mo more modern books which unfortunately just mention ha oh, yeah there are many mapping functions and what would we bother telling you about each but here they do and yeah then it's time at some point to talk about a lists and property lists like uh, here you're seeing the association lists and down there are the property lists. Only quibble I sometimes have a bit with this is that they are showing you the association lists being handled with the classical acons construct, whereas for the property lists they are actually resorting to, to the set get. Uh, construct and I deem it better to resort to set and get also for the association lists and some other books for instance Harrison's common list with artificial intelligence do show both with set and get all right then uh, let's march on to proclaim and special <laughs> which are um, both rather nicely explained over here. Here how you can be proclaiming a variable as special and thereby making it um, dynamic. And the explanation here is very intuitively given uh, that you, you can interpret proclaim special of x to mean that the variable called x always refers to the global variable x. So that means also when it is locally changed that this is going to be what is happening. And then you're getting to see a couple of um, function definitions and also how to use declare uh, by giving the type of the variable here integer in order to speed up the factorial computation. Next we shall be looking at arrays and there they do use again the set and rf constructs. Um, I saw here also something which um, let me think that I should be careful with their examples and maybe should try them out before trusting them too much because you see here they're showing you how to refer to the elements of a matrix. Uh, there is a typo. It should not be RF, but RF, which means that nobody, um, nobody ran this, you know, <laughs> like, like if you write RF is four, which it certainly is not, then who knows what else might be written with more trust, um, than is advisable to, to, to have. So anyway, um, yeah, typos happen. It's not a very big deal, but it means also, I mean, this is sound general advice. Test things before you, before you trust them all that much. 
What is very nice though, is that they are showing you how to do a matrix multiplication. And you see, the thing is that this is of course something you would be totally doing with an array. And yes, exactly with iteration. So normally you just see the RF things and uh, maybe the set RF and whatnot, but you do not actually get such a nice suggestion on how to do the most practical thing with uh, matrices, namely, you know, multiplying them and doing things like that. And I start a couple of little things which I'm not all that happy with, namely, uh, really, really weird definitions of printing by means of streams. I mean, that's perchance not something that the user quite so necessarily needs. Like, actually, it would have been perchance better from my point of view, which is perhaps just very, very personal and other people think this is nonsense, to, to just introduce one to, to print in a simpler fashion. But this is entirely, you know, consistent with what they do, showing you things systematically and not just... Um, as it would be nice, yeah? Equally, you are having a, yeah, somewhat strange, actually, introduction on reading from and writing to files. But, like, not particularly bad, only, only a little, well, perhaps unusual, like, Normally they choose the examples very well. In that case, I think it's a bit of an offbeat choice. Maybe here I'm just implying too much. I mean, positive, it must be mentioned that they do show you how to read and how to write to a file. And it shouldn't be requiring too much of the reader perhaps to to imagine that he doesn't need to go through a loop, but that he could also, you know, do, do everything else that would finally have the effect on um, getting from or writing to the file the values the reader is interested in. So, still the examples work, but they are perchance a little more complex than uh, a total novice might feel comfortable with. And now let us get to the end of the book. A couple of funny, funny peculiarities of this book towards the end. Sample list programs, you know, they really get, get you through writing a text editor, which I find exceedingly charming. And, uh, <laughs> and it's not without irony how they, how they tell you that they know that normally the examples are different, that normally you're having Tower of Hanoi, the Eight Queens Puzzle, Minimax Alpha, Beta Pruning, or a program for analyzing the natural language sentences. But, but they ignore that on purpose and get you simply to write a text editor. So I must say, uh, really funny choice and, and actually very charming and not improper for a novice. Uh, and, and of course, they, they are right that Lisp is a programming language like any other and can be used also for simple practical things. In all honesty though, I didn't try that text editor. And then comes one thing which I find so ever strange, namely that the trace is relegated somewhere towards the very end of the book. Like the trace is introduced so late is unusual from my perspective. I mean, they do mention it, so I can't say that it's missing from the book, it's not. <laughs> but it's sort of strange to put it even after the text editor. Nonetheless, I do not think that that in any way scratches on the glory of this book, which it absolutely shines with. And I mean, whoever designed the cover, he may be a little bit someone to ask questions like how do you ask, start patterns with closing parentheses? Perchance that was a way to, to, grab, to grab the attention of particularly Lispers. Anyway, it is an amazing book. It is not very large. And if you can, you can get your hands on it, I would certainly recommend getting it. And that I mean independently 
of whether you are a novice or an advanced list programmer, as in both cases, you will be able to learn something new from it, either in terms of getting a really, really, really like basic introduction, like which patent thesis you should type where, if you remember in the very beginning, but also for the advanced one to see um, systematic dependencies elucidated clearly. And for that, this book review is over. Thank you very much for having been here today. Hope you will join sometime soon again. Until then, have a wonderful time. And from me, goodbye.